The following presentation titled Future Concepts for Training and Assessment in High-Pressured Environments is approximately 20 minutes in duration. It was as delivered by League Consultant for the Northern Hemisphere, Amy Mangan, at the Shepherd SAR Conference in Dublin on Friday the 16th of March 2012. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. I will be presenting on future concepts for training and assessment in high pressured environments. My experience is in the maritime SAR environment. In terms of placement, my presentation is formulated to apply to individual operators and throughout organizations which contribute to SAR operations. The focus is on the end services which is supported by international policy some of which we have been hearing about over the past day and a half. I am pleased to have seen parallels uh, between other presentations in sectors such as aviation and at European and intercontinental levels. Here are some of the phrases which have caught my attention over the past day and a half. Throughout my presentation I will draw upon the relevance of these concepts to the maritime SAR environment and perhaps even highlight some differences. But first, just a bit about my own background and current placement. My areas of operation extend around the coast of the UK and Ireland, where I have worked as a SAR vessel operator, personnel and business manager, and trainer and assessor within the inshore and coastal SAR sector for over a decade. I continue to train, assess, and operate with both the Royal National Lifeboat Institution and the Irish Coast Guard specialising in a broad range of operations on open and enclosed craft of under 24 metres in length. I also work within the commercial offshore sector under BP's Project Jigsaw, which provides emergency response and routine standby cover to offshore installations in the North Sea. Launching and recovering these 19 metre, 32 tonne twin-decked rescue craft daily from supply vessels. I am fortunate in that I operate independently across these organizations and sectors, which enables me to keep my skill sets current whilst at the same time collating best practice and lessons learned from a wider than usual, usual catchment. We have heard throughout the other presentations of the need for specialized SAR training. How does this arise in the maritime sector? Well, external regulations outline minimum requirements. In the industry much of the regulation arises from the Pipe Brow for disaster and in the maritime SAR sector it was the sinking of the RMS Titanic. An example of the propagation of training standards from international frameworks to operator level are that international bodies such as the IMO create recognized model courses. Government authorities set operator certification requirements. National bodies administer training in accordance and centers or trainers deliver this training. Organizations utilize and often adapt training. So why do these internationally approved frameworks frequently require adjustment? There cannot be a one size fits all solution in terms of training, procedures or operation. As every SAR organization, its operations and operators are unique. Frameworks provide a baseline, the minimum standards, which organizations need to develop to ensure they fit the service being provided and match the high standards required in operation. Tailoring frameworks can also afford better resource utilization. The core principles of training and development can be applied to any organizational structure. Train and assess people so they may develop experience and gain judgment enabling them to perform at a consistently high standard within the operating environment. The challenge is to create training and assessment structures which adequately prepare and assess our operators for the pressures and difficulties faced in the operating environment. Nationally accredited courses are widely accepted as the benchmark for rescue vessel operators. However, when examining the content and delivery gaps are left in areas specific to SAR operation. Organizations who outsource certified training will find that they need to commit further resources to internal training and assessment processes to assure these core SAR skills are obtained. There are 
general trends which are common across organizations and sectors. However, unlike the aviation industry, technological developments have served to increase operational complexity within the maritime SAR environment, as the equipment being carried and operating parameters of small craft has increased. For example, radar is now standard on most rescue ribs. The level of risk to which operators are exposed to in the training environment is decreasing at a time when the previous maritime experience of our operators is also decreasing. Martin Smith, Divisional Inspector Island for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, stated earlier that only one in ten of their volunteers now has previous maritime experience. The important challenge is that organizations need to continue to identify and bridge gaps between training and operations and create systems to promote and ensure best practice. A critically important element of SAR training and operations is to balance risk. On paper, this is a simple process in which organizations list the hazards and risks faced in operation, identify the benefits, and consider controls to reduce risk and maintain benefits. I continue to observe a lack of engagement with risk management processes across all levels of the organizations which I believe is fueled by difficulties in quantifying risk and benefits. Advancing our use of information intelligence is of critical importance here. Some, some of the trends which contribute to ineffective risk management are organizational structures tend to over-modulize risk management, resulting in miscalculation of risk ratings at an organizational level. Lack of clarity between individual responsibility and organizational liability causes personnel and authority, particularly in the training environment, to err on the side of caution, which serves to create an imbalance between training and operation. Training and assessment is frequently viewed or resourced as the same entity, which can adversely affect either assessment outcomes or skill retention. I have selected some common examples to explain these trends further. In this example, operators are drilling a heavy weather technique in calm conditions. As seen here, even a small increase in the conditions significantly alters the risks faced in operation. Is it possible that the lower level of risk in the drill environment could actually be serving to increase the likelihood or severity of incidents in operation? To answer this fully, we would need to consider whether this is a training or assessment drill together with the level of the operator's experience. Consider risk management within your own organization. Do the risks encountered within the training environment equal those faced in operation? Miscalculation can occur if the full organizational picture is not considered in risk management. This example revolves around live man overboard drills. Organizations have opted to veto live drills in training and assessment environments, as the risk of personal injury is controlled with the use of training mannequins, which still afford the tangible benefits in terms of training approach and casualty handling. Applied back to the wider SAR context, operators are now conducting their first live casualty pickup in the uncontrolled and potentially high risk SAR tasking. Consider how this risk reduction in the training and assessment environment has affected operational risk? Does it serve to increase the overall risk rating within the organization? What if training and assessment were treated as separate entities? Would risk management be more effective if operators first trained with mannequins demonstrating competence prior to being assessed with live casualties? Could this give a clearer indication of performance within assessment and would it increase overall organizational safety?